<laughs> I mean, old school in the best way possible. A at its earliest 120 year old recipe. I even went old school garnish and cut a piece of lemon and dipped it in some chopped parsley. Uh, that is uh, a German schnitzel. Uh, from the Luchau's restaurant uh, cookbook, a dish that has been cooked for, uh, I, the technique is hundreds of years old, um, made famous at Luchau's. It is not an Austrian schnitzel, the kind that's super crispy that we all learned over the years past, mostly from uh, one of the people that I love to read, Kenji lopez Alt, uh, that a, simply, a, a simple brush of a giant pounded out cutlet uh, brushed with uh, vodka, for example, and then dipped in flour, egg, and breadcrumb will actually create airy pockets of awesomeness, uh, especially if you fry it in two different temperatures of oil. Um, this is a German schnitzel, not an Austrian one, from Luchau's, one of the restaurants that I grew up in in the 60s in New York City. Hello, everybody. I'm Andrew Zimmern. Uh, welcome to AZ Cooks, Instagram Live edition. Why do we call it that when we, oh, I know why, because uh, we put this on YouTube. I guess it should also be the YouTube edition. Uh, thanks to our partners at Florida Kanye Rum and Shun Cut Cutlery. Um, two fantastic sponsors. Uh, I love my sponsors. Um, sorry, I'm upset. Can you hear this as well as I can? It's not even on the heat, but a crispy bunch of twice cooked fingerling potatoes um, that I'm just keeping nice and warm over here. Um, this dish is exactly uh, uh, how it would be, how it was served at Luchau's for all of its run. It closed, uh, I think, almost a decade ago, just a little short of that. Uh, I believe it opened in the 1870s in New York City. Um, had a magnificent run. So many of these restaurants are being lost. And the reason why I love cooking lost food from lost restaurants um, is that it helps me reconcile the fact that we lost 30% of our independent restaurants um, already uh, over the last 19, 20 months during the COVID experience to date. Um, and we've lost a lot of other businesses too, but I'm into food and we intersect mostly uh, in food at our own tables, at our houses and in restaurants. And we've lost so many and I truly believe if we do not refill the uh, Restaurant Revitalization Fund, the RRF, administered by the SBA, if we don't get another 40, 45 million dollars in there to fulfill the 70 billion dollars worth of applications that were processed through, uh, remember we only had 29 billion dollars that went into that. The need was 70 some odd, um, so there's a shortfall. Um, I think we're going to lose more, and um, that's desperately sad in so many ways. Jobs for first-time employees, last-time employees, single moms, uh, students. Um, the restaurant industry, you know, new Americans, returning citizens. Restaurants are home to such a unique blend of awesome human beings. I think food people are the best people in the whole world. And it's, it's a horrific situation. And I hope it doesn't get worse. If you're on the other side of the equation and you're not a people person, you're just a money person, uh, independent restaurants are 5% of our GDP. That doesn't include the pipeline that goes in or out. Think about that. Think about all the other places that serve food or adjacent to it, all of the tourism that uh, is food adjacent. Um, you're talking about something almost 20% of GDP. We can't, we can't afford to fuck around with food. <laughs> It is deadly serious. I spent an hour on a UN panel this morning for the World Food Program. I didn't swear once, I was really good, uh, but I am so pumped uh, about this issue today. So that's why I like to cook old food. It also tastes really good, but when I cook a dish from a restaurant that had a 120 year run in New York City uh, and that was important to my family, my family celebrated birthdays and anniversaries there and uh, the occasional holiday. We even did Thanksgiving there once, which was a bad idea, uh, but it was a, you know, it was a blast. Um, bad because I loved cooking it at home. 
Um, but I was a kid, wasn't my choice. I wanted leftovers the next day, went out to eat, there's no leftovers, right? Um, but it's important because of what this plate of food symbolizes. Uh, so let's get to this um, right away. Um, you know, of course, uh, uh, unlike many cities around the country uh, that are veal cities, there's no place that I could go today and buy a veal top round and slice it myself and pound out bigger cutlets. So we have some pre-sliced veal cutlets th that came to us from our local butcher uh, today. So we're working with what we have. Um, I described to you an Austrian schnitzel, which mostly is a uh, flour egg breadcrumb mixture uh, brushed with schnapps or vodka before it goes through that process so that it develops these wonderful air pockets. Fried once in a skillet with 300 degree oil, fried again in a skillet with 375 degree oil. It fills up a whole plate and hopefully hangs over the edges and you serve it with a big lemon and a bright salad on the side and a frosty glass of beer if that's what you drink and you're in Austrian schnitzel heaven. Um, this is a central German schnitzel that actually goes into a, a very light batter. And this is, this is literally lifted from the Lu Xiao's cookbook. Um, I adapted the instructions and made them a little more simple. Recipe is on the website. I, I think I made it a little more simple. Um, but there, there are a couple really cool things in this recipe that sort of tip you to what was going on historically during the late 19th century in New York. I'm gonna to get to that in a second. Uh, the first thing I do, I have a little here because I had to make a little bit for you. I'm adding my, my milk and egg according to the recipe. Uh, I make a suggestion for using cream to make it a little uh, richer. I happen to prefer it that way. Um, I have some nutmeg, some parsley, some flour, and some Parmesan cheese. So while I'm mixing this and then I'm gonna season it, uh, I'm always asked about this, and obviously because I'm I'm not able to hear your questions right now. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who are thinking, Andrew Zimmern, why would a German restaurant in the 1880s in New York be using uh, Parmesan cheese? Well, there was a very large uh, German and Eastern European uh, immigration wave that came over uh, before the Civil War and after. Italians started to come in in much larger numbers after the Civil War, and especially in the 1880s and 90s. So at the time that Luchaus was looking for their traditional dry, think of uh, an aged Gouda that's almost golden yellow because it's so dry. You, you see them being sold uh, in markets uh, under the Rembrandt label. It's very dry and crumbly, very salty. I love grating that over pasta. Um, it's a really yummy cheese. It goes great with squash pastas if you do that with sage and brown butter. Um, but the Germans couldn't find their own cheese or it was tougher. But what was cheaper and more readily available were wheels of parm that were coming in. Remember, food wasn't regulated back in. Boats would just load up with, with cheese and come in. And with the Italian immigrants trying to get a foothold and getting into the grocery business, what was cheaper and more readily available than certain dry-aged uh, German or Northern European cheeses? Parmesan cheese, which I, I'm extremely charmed by. Um, I've seasoned this already very well with salt and with white pepper. I'm doing this now uh, sort of for show for you. And of course, I wanna circulate those seasonings into my flour. I now have seasoned flour. And you know, this is a really, really simple, simple recipe. Uh, first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add some butter to this warm pan. It's gonna start melting right away and I'm gonna raise the temperature on that uh, to about midway. I'm gonna use this butter, parsley, and lemon to finish the sauce for that dish. I'm gonna get my plate ready because this happens so fast. It doesn't take long to cook this. So I'm gonna put my homemade red cabbage recipe. This is sweet and sour red cabbage. I, I said before, this is how you would get it at Lu Xiao's. I lied. At Lu Xiao's, they would bring you the meat on one smaller plate and then your sides in little ramekins or big ramekins. Um, and so uh, you'd actually get those in ramekins. I like to have it on a plate. I am going to do the same thing. Let's make sure to kill the heat here uh, with these insanely uh, delicious potatoes. 
boy, I'll tell you something, you know, whether you do them in a pan, whether you do them in the oven, you know, really beautiful crispy fingerlings like this, always take a really nice one and put it on top. You can't serve enough potatoes with this recipe. Why is that? Well, the sauce is so ridiculously delicious. That's why. And I really want to wait for this to start sizzling, to get hot enough to start frying before I start going. I'm going to go flour. Let's see how many pieces. Yeah, you know what? I'll do those three pieces. Andrew, do you do the potatoes in butter or oil? Uh, I do them in a mixture of both. Start them in oil, finish them in butter for flavor. And do you have a favorite German restaurant in Minnesota? I do not. I do not. Sad, sad to say. Bummer. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, here's you. You want to know the honest to gosh truth? I've yet to find one that's that great. And that's sorry, sorry, German restaurants that are that are here. I, I know the Black Forest is really popular with a lot of Minnesotans. It's, it's okay. Um, the uh, I'm German Jew on one side, Russian Jew on the other, and my grandmother, uh, who taught me how to cook, was the German Jew. Uh, so this is the food, this is what I grew up on, right? And so, and I'm not that bad a cook. So I, I kind of put my stuff there, and, and yes, I make all the classics. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I put my spätzle and some of my classic German dishes. Um, I even emol I even make my own German sausages. So anyway, uh, dust in flour, so you get a little bit better adherence on your batter, and then into my batter, and then into my pan. Again, flour, batter and into my pan. And I'm going to raise the heat all the way up. These are just gonna take just, I don't know, two, three minutes. And what meat is this again? Here. This is veal, real veal. What did, uh, what did they say on uh, South Park, dead baby cows? I've never watched South Park. Really, you're missing one of the best shows ever made on TV. You've never seen South Park? No. It, well, I confessed to you the other day that I'd only seen three or four episodes of Seinfeld, which is true because the 80s were a blur uh, <laughs> to me. Um, so here's what's going to happen. Uh, these uh, little cutlets are going to cook in that butter. The butter is going to turn brown. They're going to go almost all the way on one side. I've got this up as high as it goes. So we're going to get a really nice sear on it. I probably should have had the pan just a smidge hotter uh, to begin with. But it's extremely, extremely forgiving, uh, this dish. And you can actually see the browning uh, start right now. What causes brown, uh, butter to brown and why is it so highly prized? The solids, the dairy solids in the uh, milk from which butter is made <laughs> are sweet and they actually scorch and get sweeter and slightly caramelized, which is why if your cookie recipe calls for five tablespoons butter cream with some flour, I'll substitute brown butter because I get a better caramely flavor in there. Um, you don't want it to get too carried away. Uh, the best way to lower the temperature in your pan is just flip your cutlets, those are perfect. Brown is the color of flavor. That's exactly what I want there. Wear your lederhosen. You know, I should be wearing lederhosen. I, I, I almost bought a pair of lederhosen when I was in Bavaria. Um, and they were made out of deer skin and they were just absolutely stunning. Um, and the problem with them was that when I said to the guy, done, taken, I thought I looked great in it, by the way, uh, he said, okay, those are like 9,000 US and you get them in about a year, we custom make everything. And I said, oh my gosh, that is not for me. I'm gonna put that down there. Then our next cutlet there. These are thin 
So I want to lay them halfway on each other so that, very importantly, they help retain their heat while I add some fresh butter and some lemon juice to this. Return this to a low heat. And yes, I want to scrape up all of those brown solids off the bottom there. And once I've done that, because there's flour in there, it sort of thickens the sauce all by itself. If you need a little more sauce, you can add a little bit of lemon juice. You can also add a little bit of water. I typically keep water uh, by me whenever I'm cooking because a little bit of cold water on anything will stop it from cooking anymore. So I have this beautiful brown butter sauce. I always put a little bit of parsley in there, but of course it changes color once it goes in there and gets hot. So I always put some fresh stuff uh, there. What kind of pans do you use? Uh, all kinds. Um, these are, uh, this one's a American steel, formerly Hammerstall. And then the last thing that I want to do, and like I said, you can never have too many roasted potatoes with this uh, because of that incredible butter sauce. Take a sharp knife, take a little wedge of lemon because some people love it, put it in your bowl that has the parsley. This garnish is probably as old school as it gets and just perch that on the plate as an invitation for your guests to smear that on everything. So this, this is a lesson to you all. I made this four minutes before we went on, so this is 22 minutes old. Uh, don't eat 22-minute-old uh, uh, Luchau schnitzel because you want that incredible sauce and everything to be nice and hot and luxurious and delicious. However, I will also tell you that uh, if any of you have seen the show that arguably I'm most famous for, where I've certainly eaten a lot of really crazy things, uh, I would eat this ice cold if it was out on the counter the next day. Mm. Oh my God. Um, so, mm. yeah. I'm not giving that to anyone. Um, recipe is on our website at andrewzimmern.com. As always, for those of you who may be new, no paywall. We don't collect your info. But I would encourage you to sign up for our newsletter, get lots of really cool stuff. Uh, we don't do anything with your information. We keep that very private and very proprietary. As I said, no paywall, thousands of recipes, lots of really cool content, and subscribe to our YouTube uh, channel. I will answer a question that I got today on social media. Uh, we are up to 990,000 followers on Instagram. I have been assured we're going to have a really cool contest when we get to 995,000. Is that correct, yes. Abby? Um, and of course, that will be a push towards uh, a million followers on Instagram, and there will be an incredible, incredible prize uh, for the winner. So please, uh, I'm dying. So encourage your friends who don't follow me to follow me. Let's get to 995, then we can have this really cool contest I'm thinking about. I mean, we're talking about giving away a prize worth thousands. Um, so uh, something really, really cool. Anyway, uh, your questions, your conversation, ask me whatever you want. Slaughter me, go ahead. It's been a tough day at work. I can handle it. Where are some of your favorite places to visit in Germany? Oh, my God. Uh, I love Frankfurt, and I love the farm country around Frankfurt. Um, there's a small little town outside of Frankfurt uh, called Grossbergvedel that's very uh, important to me. Um, both a friend's family and my family had uh, relatives in Grossbergvedel. Um, it is, it's one of those tiny little German farm towns where in the middle of summer there's an asparagus festival. We're talking about like two roads in Grossbergvedel, right? Um, where you still see people, you know, with wooden, giant wooden forks dealing with hay and um, 
Chanterelle festivals and the food is spectacular. G Germany is one of the most underrated countries to travel in in all of Europe. I'm, I've, it's always puzzled me. Like, I get it because it's warm and there's beaches and stuff like that. Uh, but if you haven't driven the romant uh, romantic road, if you haven't gone through the Black Forest, if you haven't done Oktoberfest in Munich, if you haven't explored uh, the other side of Berlin, uh, what was uh, former East Berlin, um, you've, you've not experienced some incredible communities that are doing some incredibly vibrant things. If you're really into clubs and nightlife and music and you're not doing East Berlin and some of the stuff that's going on there, you were missing some of the best late night fun I've ever had in my life. Can you make this with chicken? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I make these kind of schnitzels with all kinds of meat, lamb, chicken. I've done it with fish fillets uh, and just up the lemon quotient a little bit um, and added some capers or not. Uh, but yeah, I've made this exact dish with chicken on more than one occasion. What's the strangest thing you have cooked? The strangest thing that I have cooked, oh my gosh, um, uh, probably uh, shipwreck worms and other things like that that live in the ocean that no one else would eat except uh, indigenous people, first people somewhere that have traditionally eaten it and put a bowl in front of me and I'd rather be a good guest than a freaked out or obnoxious American TV host and I've gone ahead uh, and eaten it. Um, but I also I had a really strange experience um, with uh, fermented whale oil uh, in central Alaska. Um, it was about 30 below zero out. Fermented whale and seal oil was on the table. And uh, very dried fish <laughs> was being dipped into that to loosen it and it had a funky, rotted flavor uh, to the oil. And, uh, but I tend to like those kinds of things. Like I like anchovies and stuff like that. So, um, and I'd gotten a taste for these foods over the course of the first four or five years making uh, bizarre foods. This was about season six or seven. And I kept dunking in there. And the, the family I was eating with, the two daughters, uh, spoke the best English. Uh, and they, they kept telling me, uh, slow down on the on the seal oil and the whale oil. And I was like, oh, and I thought that they were saying like, you're being a pig, you're taking, because there was just a few tablespoons in a, in a little ramekin of each. So I thought they were saying like, you know, go easy, you're, you're taking some very precious commodity that you're taking too much of and just being very blunt and honest. And I really appreciated that. So I slowed down, but the director really wanted more shots of me eating it because obviously me eating the whale or seal oil was, just a, a really profoundly uh, enjoyable experience for what he for the viewer, and so he's getting shot. Take another bite. Okay, now dip a little more. Now let's get a close up of you. Bite. So I kept. I wound up having like ten more dunks of it, and instead of eating a teaspoon, I ate three times as much in total as you should a tablespoon. And I'm looking at these people like, well, that was great, and I apologize for eating so much, and they're just shaking their heads, looking at me like an idiot. And as they're doing that the room starts to spin, and I don't remember anything else until I'm outside in my underwear, and uh, these incredible people, these six members of this family were hold, I woke up in their arms, three feet off the snow. They had just carried me outside in 30 degrees, and they were rubbing my extremities, trying to make sure I had blood in there and didn't get frostbite and stuff like that. And the reason they were telling me to slow down was because it will mess up your head because it raises your, this fermented whale and seal, seal oil is consumed in little bits all day long so that they can deal with the cold. It raises your body temperature, like if you had a fever. So I went, instead of at 100 where it was like, okay, I went to like 103, way too fast, and it was, it was a problem. So in, in, when, it, when it comes to strange, I think that's right up there. Someone asks, what inspires you? What inspires me? Uh, other people overcoming shit. I just don't think there's anything more amazing in the whole world. Someone posted uh, something on Sunday, and it was, it was it, I hate this phrase, it went viral. Uh, and I saw lots of other websites and other places posted. It was a picture of a cop, a white cop, 
leaning over the railing on a bridge. Turned out it was really, really high bridge. And there was a young black man, and he was kind of hanging on with one arm, and clearly by his body position didn't really care if he fell. And the, the quote, on the, the blurb underneath it explained that the, the, the black man had climbed over the railing, was trying to kill himself. The white cop spent two hours talking him down and got him to climb back in. And then there was a second slide, which was the picture of them today. And it turned out it was a 20-year-old picture. And now that man that was trying to kill himself is the father of three and now is a community leader on mental health awareness and lectures around the country and has written books. And he had finally been reunited with the guy that saved his life and talked him out of it that day. And I thought, what an incredible thing. The minute you sprinkle another human being in a tough situation with dignity and respect and you watch them, you watch their transformative experience, what an incredible contribution. How missed that man would have been if he had followed through and taken his own life. And then on top of it, with all of the bullshit that's going on today, where you know people are looking at the color of people's skin and judging them by it, I was just, it, it really touched me. So that's the kind of stuff that gets to me, whether it's saccharin or whether it's just someone telling me about someone else who's inspiring. I, I love it, absolutely love it. What would be your last meal? Oh, great question. I get that. Uh, I get that answer quite a bit, so I know exactly what the answer is. I want a dozen of the biggest cherry stone clams that you can find. Hopefully, I've dug them out of uh, the, the bay myself with a clam rake. I'm sitting on uh, Indian Wells or Georgica Beach in East Hampton, Long Island. Uh, I am uh, in a chair. It's 6 o'clock. It's summertime, so the sun doesn't really go down till 8. I eat my clams, I go out, I ride waves for a half an hour as the tide rises and get the last ones in. Uh, and then I get to eat my grandmother's roast chicken uh, and uh, some veg, you know, maybe some potato pancakes with it. Uh, and then Prince Puckler's uh, coffee ice cream or just any really good premium coffee or espresso ice cream uh, for dessert. And I am, I am good to go. At that point, take me, Lord. Was that overly dramatic? A I, little. A I little think bit. it was good. Where bit. are you going to be this weekend? Uh, New York City Wine and Food Festival. Come on down. I'm hosting the Backyard Barbecue on Sunday. I'm doing a demo on Sunday uh, in the Great Food Hall. Um, and it's going to be a blast. I'm thrilled uh, that the New York City Wine and Food Festival is back. Uh, Friday night is Burger Bash. Uh, that's really what kicks it all off. The Sunday uh, you know, Backyard Barbecue, my event, sort of closes it all up. Uh, I can't wait to be there and, and interact and see my fans. You need proof of vaccination. We are socially distancing. We, I know they're only selling half as many tickets. And I mentioned this the other week. Go to NewYorkCityWineFoodFestival.com. It's just the initials, I think. Uh, N-Y-C-W-F-F.org -F -F. Uh, or dot .com? Dot org. Dot org. Thank you, Abby. I've typed and it out a lot this you week. You go there. It's, it's up. You can, if you follow me, you're already getting links to it. Um, go there and even write a check for $5 or put everyone on your email list and alert them to the fact we've only sold half as many tickets. All the profit goes to charity, um, uh, which includes so many groups that are feeding the hungry in New York City. So we're not able to give as much money this year because we're only selling half as many tickets. So we need people who can't go to either spread awareness or spare a dollar, one or the other. Um, thank you so, 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 so much. Uh, we are, uh, we're back next week. We're doing something, uh, oh, I think I'm doing uh, firecracker shrimp, aren't I? Yes. Oh, I'm very excited about that. I may throw in a little secret surprise with my uh, Badia spices. By the way, been getting a lot of questions uh, about this. Um, they sit here all the time because we use them. I go through about a jar of this uh, a week because I love curry salads. I love hot curries. I love using the spice in all kinds of things. I love sprinkling a tablespoon or two of any of them over popcorn. Um, they are available uh, at stores near you at BadiaSpices.com, links on my website to them. Uh, Walmart carries them, a lot of major retailers. Um, but here's the most important thing. I think starting next week, you can buy them uh, on Amazon. 
uh, which is great. I think they come in cases there, um, but we're all food preppers, right? We have to prepare for Armageddon. Uh, buy your cases on Amazon. Uh, but in all seriousness, there's lots of different ways to buy singles, uh, the set, cases, whatever. Please, 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 if you don't see them at a grocery store near you, let them know. Uh, Badia's sales team is out there trying to get them into as many stores as they can. And I have to tell you, it's an incredible uh, spice, uh, series of spice blends that really transports you to other parts of the world. I know everyone says this, but eating these is an experience, an adventure, uh, not just another meal. Um, thank you so much. Thanks to our sponsors, Shun and uh, the folks at Florida Kanya Rum. Um, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Abby. Uh, thank you, uh, Heidi, uh, for helping me prep all this stuff and get ready for today. Uh, but most importantly, thank you. Be kind to each other. The world needs more of it. See you later.